Chapter 7 of Claude Lightfoot, or How the Problem Was Solved by Father Francis Finn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7, in which Claude astonishes his examiners in catechism, and Harry Archer in matters of baseball. On Monday, Claude had passed through the storm. On Tuesday, he basked in the sunshine. The class of First Communion, having completed the catechism, was to be examined on this day by a board consisting of the president, vice-president, and a professor of the faculty. It was to be a contest, as well as an examination, for upon its result was to depend the awarding of two prizes, the first being a handsome pocket edition of the New Testament, and the second a Morocco-bound Thomas Akempis. Owing mainly to Claude, the examination went on briskly, as Dan Dockery put it, Claude was first, and the others were nowhere. At the end of the set examination, the president began to quiz the class. "'Here's a question,' he said, "'that isn't in your catechism exactly as I put it, but it's quite easy. Who has the right of giving the Holy Eucharist?' "'A priest!' cried several. "'Could a religious, not in holy orders, give it?' "'No, sir.' could a living saint supposing he were not a priest touch the consecrated host no sir why is the church so strict in this matter there was a silence the boys looked at each other at first then as if by common consent fixed their eyes on claude i think father said claude that it's because of the great reverence which we should show to our lord and you are quite right, Claude. The Church hedges the Holy Eucharist about with all manner of restrictions, for fear lest men through familiarity should lose their reverence. However, can any of you think of an instance where even a layman might give Holy Communion? The faces of all the boys, save Claude's, became blank. Claude's brow furrowed with lines. What do you say, Claude? i'm thinking father suppose a man were dying and no priest could be got and suppose that the blessed eucharist were at hand might a layman give it to the dying man i think he might sir in that case why claude because there's no other chance of the dying man's getting communion and besides as father maynard says the sacraments are all for the good of the people. You are right, Claude, but the case is so extreme that practically it comes to nothing. Whenever there's any question about the Holy Eucharist, it can be answered if we keep in mind that we owe it the greatest love on the one hand, and on the other the deepest reverence. That brings another question to my mind, broke in the vice-president, you all know how extremely strict the church is in insisting on a total fast from midnight for those who are to communicate the reason for this exceeding strictness is the high reverence we owe our divine lord now is it ever allowed for a person to receive holy communion who has broken the fast yes sir answered dan dockery any one who is dying may receive the holy eucharist whether he is fasting or not correct but who can give me another case where the law of fasting ceases to bind oh i know sir cried claude springing to his feet and then dropping back in confusion at his forwardness a person not fasting could receive holy communion even if there weren't a priest at hand to give it in order to save it from being insulted by bad men or by wicked soldiers in time of war where did you learn that asked the astonished vice-president while his fellow examiners exchanged glances of surprise my sister read it to me out of a book sir you have answered well out of reverence we fast before going to communion out of reverence only those in holy orders may touch the sacred host but again out of love for the honour of our lord fasting and all other rules may should an extreme occasion arise be done away with then the quizzing went on 
i have here set down but two of the questions with their answers first to show how quick and thorough claude was secondly because as the reader shall find out later they will throw much light on claude's subsequent history father maynard said the president immediately after the examination i congratulate you on the thorough preparation you have given all your boys but as for that little cricket i never saw anything like it indeed i couldn't imagine a boy of his years better prepared i can hardly claim any credit for that some of claude's knowledge seems to be infused he did not know that kate infused it at noontime claude was in his element as he stepped up to the home plate with his bat throw the ball with all your might he piped to the pitcher it came straight and swift there was a sharp crack and claude ran for first base while the ball shot into the air and struck the college building far over the left fielder's head when his turn came again he sent the ball straight over second base next he drove a long fly into right field and then claude was happy the bat had come up to his expectations for not only could he hit hard with it but he could place the ball in any field he chose few small boys think of attempting scientific batting they strike as hard as they can and are glad if they succeed in hitting the ball at all but claude with his singularly steady eye and wondrous flexibility of muscle was never haunted with the fear of striking out there was no question as to his hitting or not hitting the ball therefore he could pay attention to the placing of his hits he gave promise of becoming a marvellous batter where are you going after school claude asked harry archer to the east side to take my sister home from school i wanted to have a talk with you about tomorrow's game well why not walk along with me harry scratched his head i could go with you as far as the state street bridge all right i shall wait for you here after class now began harry running his arm through claude's that afternoon as the boys with books and satchels came trooping into the yard i want to tell you about the rockaway club there are the crack small boys nine of the east side and they haven't lost a game this season didn't they ever play our nine yes last year and they won three straight from us two of the games were pretty close but in the last game they beat us twelve to three were our fellows afraid of them no but the rockaways had strengthened their nine ours was the same now of course they don't want to break their record by letting us beat them this year and some of our college fellows from the east side have been blowing about your pitching so that they've become terribly worked up and now they are trying to steal a march on us how's that they've been scouring the city for undersized good players you know the agreement between us is that all players on either side must be under fifteen well they've got hold of three sawed offs stumpy little chaps and one of them is sixteen and the other two fifteen all three are splendid players and they're going to be put in the infield how did you hear about it harry oh i keep my eyes open and besides i got frank elmwood to look out for me and now i'm thinking of getting in two undersized fellows from the south side to strengthen our nine too two wrongs don't make a right said claude with a laugh archer thought for a moment that's so let's show our pluck anyhow even as it is we can beat em if we use our heads but some of them are awful batters i've been following them up every game they played this spring and i tell you there are three or four of them if they get the ball where they want it we'll send it to glory every time oh if i only knew the kind of balls they wanted sighed claude oh i can fix that said harry eagerly i know the weak and strong batting points of every fellow on the regular nine and i've got elmwood to find out about the three outsiders 
Tonight I'll write down their names and put after each the kind of ball they can hit and the kind they can't. It'll be hard work for me, but it'll be just as hard for you to learn it by heart. Claude smiled. <laughs> I can save you all that trouble, Harry. Just name your boys and tell me all you know about them. You can't remember it all. You'll get names and everything else mixed up. Try me, said Claude. Then Harry started out and talked, 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 in one continuous flow of baseball slang, not even pausing when the bridge was reached. He seemed to have forgotten his intention, for on he went across the river, giving the results of his close and long-continued observations. It was only when they had gone six squares further east that he came to a pause. "'Gracious!' he added, after catching his breath. "'That was the longest speech I ever made. But of course you can't remember it.' "'Listen,' said Claude, and he did listen with distended eyes and open mouth. For Claude repeated what he had heard, almost word for word, and without omitting a single material point. "'My goodness!' gasped Harry. "'How do you do it?' "'Ask my sister. But how long can you remember it? For two or three days, even if I were not to think of it again. But I'll go over it tonight once more, Harry, and you'll see tomorrow that I haven't forgotten.' Suddenly Harry turned and fled. The girls were just coming out of the convent. End of chapter 7